photodynamic therapies is really an exciting type of therapy that has uh, evolved. And it's been around for a long time. We've used it for skin cancer, you know, things that are very superficial that we have easy access to, where we can then combine a photosensitizer that we apply directly onto the tumor site you know, on the skin, and then we blast it with light. Welcome to today's episode of the Beljansky Cancer Talk Show. In this episode titled Innovations in Light-Based Cancer Therapy, Sylvie and I are honored to welcome the founder of the Cartfell Center, Dr. Michael. Today, Dr. Michael shares his insights into the transformative power of light-based therapies and cancer treatment. Drawing from his vast experience, he illuminates the promising advancements in this field and their profound impact on patients' lives. Join us as we dive into the groundbreaking work of Dr. Michael and explore the potential of light-based cancer therapy to revolutionize the landscape of cancer care. Dr. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Please give the audience a little intro of who you are and what you do. Well, thank, thank you so much. It's a, I, always an honor. It's always, you know, Sylvie and I, we, we go, go way back and it's always an honor to get to chat with her on, online. <laughs> Not so way back. Come Not on. Way back. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're too young for that, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm yes, yeah, so thank you so much. I'm I'm a I'm a naturopathic doctor and uh, what that means is that I I focus on using the natural means to support the body to heal itself and where you then uh, recognizing the innate wisdom that exists within the body. And we always want to recognize that the, the, you know, our bodies, that innate wisdom is the best doctor. So if we can support that in any possible way, uh, then we are always better off. You know, pharmaceuticals, yes, they play a role uh, and they're needed at some point. But if we can use it more in a kind of more holistic way than, than then that is always better to start with. So that that's kind of the what sums up naturopathy and what we do here. Uh, and I've been doing this. I'm in clinical practice. Oh, for... so, ex, ex, excuse me if I interrupt. When will you say uh, what will we do here? So tell us for first, where is your clinic? <laughs> yeah, where 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 is here? Yes. <laughs> so yes, yeah. I've I've been in clinical practice since 1987, and and here, like, like Sylvie is, is mentioning, is it's the Carlfeld Center, and, and it's a, we have a beautiful building here in, in Boise, Idaho, uh, 17,000 square feet, uh, where uh, people fly in from a little bit all over the world you know, to uh, get therapies, and we, we focus a lot on integrative oncology. So we, uh, we, we brought in a lot of the, kind of the top tools in order to be able to make sure that we support people that go through that journey, uh, because I've I feel that people that are in that journey, there aren't that many options out there. Uh, the, uh, the medical field really haven't presented with much more than what they had like 50 years ago. Yeah, it seems to still be kind of the, the, the cut burn or, or you know, poison. Uh, they brought in a little bit of the immunotherapy, uh, a little hormonal therapy. But other than that, it, it really hasn't changed much. So it then come upon us to be able to do that. So, so that that's what so, we so how, do here. How do you? How do you? How? What is your own definition of oncology? Uh, holistic oncology, uh, and how is that different from the traditional approach? Yes. Yeah, so it, it has the traditional approach has been that you know there, it is a genetic dysfunction. And uh, we're we're there to kill the genes with with genetic dysfunction, and so uh, so that has been kind of the the genomic th uh, theory that has existed for for a long time, and uh, what we are uh, shifting towards, and from uh, my view of cancer, and and you know, a lot of my colleagues you know, share that that opinion. Uh, is that it is more of a metabolic dysfunction and, and it is a, a cell that enters into a, a survival state, a cell survival state, and where it's shifting how it is producing energy. And uh, that way, you know, it's more of a fermentation, so it's called the Warburg effect. 
you know, where the uh, the cancer cell then shift towards fermenting sugar to produce energy rather than using oxygen. And so, uh, and what we're seeing is that the mitochondria actually holds the key and mitochondria is like the energy factory of the cell. So the mitochondria actually holds the key in regulating you know, the health of the, of the genes. So uh, yes, there are genetic dysfunctions, but the mitochondria play a huge role into you know, whether oncogenes, which are uh, genes that you know, promotes cancer, whether they're turned on or turned off, or whether uh, oncosuppressor you know, genes, which are the ones that suppress cancer, whether they're turned on or turned off. You know? So the mitochondria seems to control all of that. So then that becomes like a major player in, in as we are addressing cancer. And that's what we're, we're seeing from an integrative approach is you know, working on, on supporting the mitochondria and then with that all, also the terrain that the mitochondria exist in, which is you know, what's floating around in the cell. You know, we have a lot of heavy metals, chemicals, bugs, you know, what, what's going on in there? So all of these factors so, so, become really so, important. So what you are saying is it's a, diff, a shift in the concept of cancer causation and that uh, opens new avenues of treatments, right? Exactly, and that that's the exciting part. Is that you know the the way we've gone about it, and you know the cancer researchers, you know, e even though it's hard to shift, I mean, because they it is such a big business uh, researching cancer, so there's only so fast that that shift can take place. Uh, so even though they recognize that the the tree that they've been barking up <laughs> has been the wrong tree, yeah. So uh, they're starting to recognize that that they they need to shift. And with that, and exactly what Sylvia is saying is that we do need them to shift the type of therapies that we are doing. And so now we instead of just going on to attack, you know, to kill, 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 or or cut or burn. Yeah, we can now start to look at you know, what is the health of the mitochondria and what do we need to do to support that? And you know, what is impacting the mitochondria and how does that affect your genetics? And how does that affect also your, micro, your, your tumor microenvironment? You know, because that starts to play a huge role as well. So it's all these additional factors that, you, that hasn't been taken into account and then an extra layer, cancer stem cells. You know, that, that's another one that people haven't really thought about or, or you know, addressed because we know that the regular medical therapies really, really don't deal with that very well. In fact, it actually promotes it rather than you know, mm -hmm. suppressing it. So we're then needing to look for therapies where we can then suppress cancer stem cell activity and then control the, you know, support the mitochondria control the tumor microenvironment. And so, so that opens a lot of, you know, a lot of exciting avenues in therapy. So you were speaking of exciting avenues. Uh, what specific uh, exciting uh, therapy uh, can people uh, hope uh, find when they come to, if they, I mean, which makes it worth traveling to your, to your clinic? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, and they, yeah, there's a number of different wonderful ones. I mean, for example, you have the, the poly MVA DCA has been a combination of IVs that uh, that is really seen very promising results. And really, I mean, and yeah, you know, yes, we, we are doing a lot of great things. Doesn't mean that we fix everybody and fix everything. Uh, we are still, you know, we're still on a learning curve with with cancer. But you know, shifting then how we are we're addressing it, we seem to be getting better results than we used to. And yeah, in the integrative space you know, that that exists within, uh, it has shifted a lot from let's say 2000 to now. You know, the tools we have now are so much more you know, advanced and, and targeted. So the yeah, like the poly MBA DCA. So you have DCA. It stands for dichloroacetate. And what that does, it then blocks how the cancer uh, is able to produce energy. So it blocks that fermentation pathway. And then the poly MVA will then drive, you know, so that's another IV that we do. It will drive then energy through the mitochondria so that either, you know, A, you know, the, the cell is healthy enough to be repaired uh, because we're working on the mitochondria. 
or B, you know, it is too far gone. So the mitochondria says, hey, you know, we, we got to shut down operation, flip the switch and the, the cell breaks down. So, so that's one kind of looking at the metabolic component. And then we have other things like we we'll work on, uh, like ferroptosis is another one where we use, we recognize within the cancer, uh, it is very, uh, in addition to sugar hungry, you know, so that's where we use some metabolic. And that's why it's so good also to control what it is that you're eating and also use some tools to bring down your blood sugar level uh, because, you know, sugar feeds cancer. So we, we want to control that. But then cancer also loves iron. So then we have the process what's called ferroptosis, where we can use the excessive iron that exists within the cancer cell and then, and, and then oxidize that to cre uh, trigger oxidation in cancer cells. So that becomes very targeted as well uh, because you know, we have that excessive iron there. And then the cancer cells lack an enzyme called catalase. So it doesn't have a lot of protection against that oxidative effect of the iron that exists within uh, the cell. Normal cells are able to protect themselves and they have less of the iron. So, uh, so we bring in then high dose vitamin C, which has been around for a while. That's been kind of a standby and it's still kind of a standby you know, for, or standard, I should say, for uh, cancer therapy. But we add then things like artisanate, you know, which is a, a constituent of wormwood. You know, it's, it's come from wormwood. And that is really fantastic in triggering that ferroptosis process. And then you can then... Uh, and shift how you're eating a little bit around that. And you may even bring in some uh, repurposed uh, pharmaceuticals to help in that process. But a lot of times just kind of doing the IV, keeping your blood sugar low uh, and being kind of in a ketogenic state, uh, that helps as well. So those, those are two great tools. I understand you are also doing a photodynamic therapy. Can you tell us more about what that is? Yes, yeah, so, so photodynamic therapy is, is really an exciting type of therapy that, that has uh, evolved. And it's been around for a long time. Uh, in fact, uh, not, I mean, as early as the you know, early 1900s, we used ultraviolet light to radiate uh, blood to kill off pathogens. And so we've, we've had it before in that fashion. And also we've used it for... Uh, like skin cancer, you know, things that are very superficial that we have easy access to, where we can then combine a photosensitizer that we apply directly onto the tumor site, you know, on the skin, and then we blast it with light. So the photosensitizer will then pull, it will increase the amount of energy uh, that is pulled into the cancer cell, and that triggers an oxidation of the cancer cells because it and in addition to kind of that oxidation also has a very thermal effect. So it actually triggers like excessive heat within uh, the, the tumor, within the cancer cells. So, and, and cancer can't really handle that, that variation in therapy or variation in, uh, in, uh, in, in temperature like normal cells can. So by bringing more heat, you know, that like hyperthermia is a common type of therapy. So photodynamic triggers that hyperthermia effect within the tissue uh, in addition to uh, triggering that oxidation. And, and you need then the, the photosensitizer and you need then a, a specific wavelength of laser light, you know, so it's strong enough to hit the tissue and, and it needs to match the photosensitizer. And then you need oxygen in that tissue, you know, because if there's no oxygen, it won't oxidize. So, so that's kind of the, the basic of the photodynamic. And, and so, it was, as I mentioned, it was only used externally, but there's new technology that we uh, are brought in uh, that uh, working with Dr. Weber in Germany, uh, utilizing uh, his type of tools, we're then able to then get to tumors that are deeper in, in the body. So we can uh, we and know. How, how do you decide which patient is going to... How do you decide which patient is going to be a good candidate for such treatment or, or not such treatment? Well, how do you? Because it looks like you have a lot of uh, of tools uh, in your in your tricks in your in your bag. So, how do you know which one to take out of your bag? 
that, and that for do whom? What, yeah to do what and 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 that's that's always a good question um, uh, and so you have the type of tumor you have the type uh, there also where you can be a little bit more specific on the the genetics in regards to what's you know through a a, a blood sample uh, you can do that and that will also target you know it will guide us a little bit more into therapy and then also just knowing where the individual is at uh, status wise health wise strength wise because you can if somebody's strong then you can blast them with a lot of things and if they are not so strong then you have to kind of build them up a little bit and then kind of gradually bring some of these therapies in uh, in regards to the photodynamic uh, i feel that it is a benefit for everybody doesn't mean that it's going to fix everybody but i think it adds value to pretty much everybody and uh, how, how does it work for your, your patient so uh, i i hear for example this program i say oh well, that's interesting so i come to travel to to, to your clinic and uh, people stay for a while they are uh, they stay for for a different definitive i mean set of times they know in advance they have to take a hotel nearby and come to see you every uh, three times a week l l l <laughs> what does it look walk like? us through, through the experience of being a patient at your clinic and uh, a little bit what to expect mm -hmm. yeah so we we do a yeah, patient come here uh, from pretty much one to four weeks tend to be kind of the uh, the normal stay and and the different factors that play into it i mean one is you know time for the individual what type of cancer and then also financially you know if you stay longer then it then it costs costs more um and uh, we do have so when people come yeah they just come and they get like a vrbo close by and uh, and we have lots of great you know health food stores around and uh, and they tend to come here then to the clinic you know around 8 8 30 in the morning and leave around 4 35 so it, it is a whole day event and uh, you know people they just bring you know bring their own food we have a kitchen where they can uh, kind of store their food they can cook and so uh, uh, and we usually start the day with sound bowl healing you know because we i love frequency and and i think uh, just that sets the opens up the cells and the body for all the different IVs that you'll, you'll be receiving. Uh, and the therapies that you'll, you'll be getting there, there, there's certain kind of, if I would give like an example program of what somebody may get, you know, so they, they may get then, you know, the photosensitizer that I like to use is the, uh, non-anized or the, the micronized version of ICG, uh, anodine cyanine green. And, and the reason I like that photosensitizer is that it matches well with infrared. And infrared is the one that has the deepest penetration into the tissue. Uh, so as we introduce that intravenously, and we can also inject that into the tumor, if it is a tumor that we have access to, like a, a prostate or a breast or you know, a colorectal, you know, or, or skin, you know, then, then we are able then to inject directly into it as well in addition to do it intravenously. And we actually find that when we do tissue sample of the tumor, that after a few hours, we see a good concentration of the photosensitizer in the tumor. And they've, they've seen that there's a- In a few hours, and, and, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, so it goes really quickly. And, and it has to do with kind of the vascularity that feeds the tumor. You know, it's, it's very, uh, the blood vessels are very open, very disorganized, you know, so things kind of go into it quicker, you know, versus a, you know, normal blood vessels to healthy tissue is very tightly knitted, you know, things really don't enter into that, you know, very well, you know, kind of stays in circulation. So it just kind of circulates until it kind of hits where those holes are, which is, you know, the blood vessels that feeds a tumor, and then it kind of enters and into the tumor that way. And, and that just takes a, a few hours. And then after like three hours, then we want to make sure that we do the, uh, the photo, you know, do the laser therapy where we do it intravenously, do it you know, interstitially if we have access to it, or we can do it you know, externally as well. Because if we use eye infrared, 
then it, it will kind of penetrate fairly, fairly well, especially lungs, you know, because it's filled with a lot of air, you know, so there isn't a lot of resistance, you know, as we then uh, expose the lungs to, to light, you know, infrared light from the, from the outside. And so that way it can kind of trigger, trigger that oxidation. And, uh, and then with that, I, we, we I, also, go ahead. Go, go ahead. No, 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 no. Well, the, the patient's experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so they, so then the, the rest of the day we, we do, you know, other IVs, whether we use the ferroptosis, you know, during that day, you know, which vitamin C artisanate, or maybe we do the, you know, metabolic program where, which is a, the DCA poly MBA. And then also we uh, have IVs, you know, for hitting the cancer drivers and cancer stem cells a little bit more. Yeah. So we may bring in like, you know, curcumin, bosvalia, resveratrol IV, uh, EGCG IV. Uh, and then also we yeah, may bring in different oxygen type of IVs like, uh, you know, ultra, uh, uh, ozone IV, hydrogen peroxide IV, or we have, uh, it was called EBU or RHP, where we can oxygenate and ozonate about four quarts of a of the blood volume of an individual in an hour. So it helps to filter out a lot of junk and kill off a lot of pathogens and cancer cells. And and then we combine that so, with with therapies like colon hydrotherapy. Uh, we have ionic foot bath for detoxification. We have some things called the Hocket, you know, which runs about ten different therapies at the same time. Uh, you know, like ozone, carbon dioxide, hyperthermia, uh, uh, electrotherapy, uh, exercise with oxygen therapy. So it runs all these at the same time. And we and also we use a very powerful laser bed to also uh, benefit, you know, when, when the person has the photosensitizer in them to kind of maximize that oxidation of cancer cells. And uh, we also use sono, sonotherapy where we use ultrasound uh, that penetrates even deeper than light to also trigger oxidation of those cancer cells. So that's called sonodynamic therapy. Um, and then we, we use some frequency medicine like Rife medicine. We have a machine called Monocore uh, that uh, works on checking all the different uh, acupuncture points and 750 you know, uh, points of reference. And then Checks and C uses the AI artificial intelligence to see you know what are the imbalances in all these different areas and then when it finds which areas that are imbalanced it then feeds back the opposite frequency to all these different specific locations uh, to help to balance that out uh, and then we can also run uh, frequencies and for you know parasites for fungus for viruses for the, the different cancer types you know to to really help to kind okay. of balance the body that way but for somebody who has just been, for example, diagnosed with cancer, the, the sky is falling in on his or her head. Uh, and then the, the, the oncologist says, uh, well, you need to have surgery done next week because it's urgent and uh, we are going to put you right immediately on, uh, on chemotherapy follow uh, as soon as you get out of the um, uh, surgery home. So how, when, and how does your going, coming to your clinic and experiencing all those things occur on the journey of healing? Yeah. So what, what is important for people to understand that, you know, you're diagnosed with cancer and obviously nobody is
great knowledge about what to do until they're diagnosed. It's very rare that people are uh, kind of have studied it, what to do, how to eat, you know, what, what to take, etc. So uh, it becomes like drinking from a fire hose and, and you, you feel like you're in a very vulnerable state, you know, right when you're diagnosed. Uh, the oncologists usually push then for resolution quite fast and and it is important and this is something that i I've, I've heard you know i also have a podcast where i interview a, a lot of you know cancer survivors and what they did and how they did it and and so forth and the the common thread that i hear from all of them is uh, the comment that to say I, I wish i knew i had more time you know that they uh, so th i feel that that is really important you know you are in shock and you are just diagnosed it is important to take a step away and, and just kind of feel what feels right and then evaluate your different options. Uh, the oncologist will say, you got to do this, got to do this quickly. And it's like you, they put you on a conveyor belt and you just kind of move through that process. And all of a sudden, all of these things are done to your body and without you being in charge of the process. So it is really important for an individual to feel like, they are the decision makers. They are the quarterback of their own therapy. And so evaluating then, you know, how, you know, what, what the oncologist is saying, and maybe that the oncologist is right, but you do want to take that extra time and then to then reach out to other options at the same time. And that's why clinics like myself then reach out and say, I was just diagnosed. Yeah, you know, this is what the oncologist is suggesting. You know, what are your thoughts, and then we can talk that through. Uh, so it is a little different from from person to person. A lot of times, it may be good to come to me immediately. That may be kind of the best option. It may be a good time to come in between, you know, chemo sessions if chemo is really warranted, or it may be good to do it after the whole journey. Uh, what I know though is that while you're going through traditional oncology care, if that is what's needed to be done, it is really important to support yourself during that journey. So, so okay. what you are saying is that your modalities, holistic modalities are compatible with chemotherapy and you have patients undergoing chemo, their chemo treatment while coming to you. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I think from what I've seen, all the, you know, thousands of patients that I've, I've seen, uh, I would say that the people that do the best are the ones that do integrative along with traditional if they're doing traditional. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. so having those journeys really parallel so become really, really important, you know, because there are lots of things that can be done. You know, if you're receiving radiation, you know, what there are therapies you can do to really it mitigate a lot of the negative effects on radiation and help to heal faster and deal with it better and also making sure that the radiation is more effective you know that so that that is the beauty is that somebody that has the know-how in this space they're able to make the chemo that you're receiving more effective and less harmful and the same with with radiation and we discuss like the cancer stem cells that are uh, that actually gets activated by you know, any kind of insult to the tumor tissue. So then to bring in a support that will then calm these cancer, the activity of these cancer stem cells down while you're then aggravating the, the tumor area uh, becomes really important. So yes, I, I would always want to kind of have them work side, you know, side by side, you know, depending on whether you're going to come to me, you know, my center in the beginning of the journey, middle of the journey, end of the journey that depends a little bit what's going on yeah you, you mentioned the uh, eating right also do you offer so nutritional uh, advice uh, supplements uh, what about this aspect which is actually maybe the most common but people are also short of knowing what to do when it comes to to themselves yeah, f food becomes really important because you you can you know every bite you're taking either feeds the cancer or it can be a weapon against cancer. So kind of recognizing what is the the best type of diet for you. Uh, there are I, I have kind of general prefaces. I tend to lean more towards like a ketogenic type of diet. Uh, doesn't mean that everyone does well with that. 
it is important to kind of check an individual's genetics and see how they how they process foods, how they process protein, how they process fats, carbohydrates, and that will kind of guide us as well. You know where where we kind of lean our emphasis, uh, and also it depends on where the individual is in their journey. You know, like for instance, when they receiving chemo, it is good to fast. You know, prior to you know because that fasting. It will then really enhance the effect of the chemo into the tumor tissue because the cancer, you know, it gets it's starving because it's it's not cancer cells aren't very efficient in producing energy, which means that they require a lot. So when you are starving, you know, they really starve more than you do, you know, because they they need this such a high turnover of energy. So it, when you're starving prior to chemo, then the the cancer cells just kind of I need food. I need something. So then the chemo. So they open themselves up, and they they have less of a defense. And then the uh, chemo will then enter into the cancer cells much more uh, efficiently and, and at, at a higher concentration. And the opposite happens with healthy cells. Meaning the healthy cells they recognize, oh, we are starving. There's stress going on. We need to protect ourselves, and they go into a protection mode. And so they are not open for the chemo. They're actually protecting the self more. So, you know, so for instance, then doing the, the, you know, the fasting prior to, uh, or the, there you can do like a fasting mimicking diet becomes really powerful. Uh, and then bringing in, you know, little kind of fasting periods, whether you're doing chemo or not, you know, where you, uh, where you support a process called autophagy, where you're cleaning out, you know, unhealthy cells. Um, and becomes a really powerful tool as well. You, you have a, a book with a lot of advices for people who are interested in, in learning more. Can you tell us more about your book? Yeah, and, and do we, actually, let me let me sh show you here uh, a, a better way to treat cancer. If you if you can read in the opposite direction. <laughs> yes, but, no, no, we, we see it right. Yes, yeah, so you can see it, it's it's a big book, and we I, I started out <laughs> started out as as I was thinking I was just going to write a, a two hundred pager, and uh, uh, and and that would was going to be enough. But you know, lo and behold, we had to make the format of the book bigger, and it ended up being like five hundred pages plus <laughs> because it is hard to to cover all the areas that I wanted to cover. Uh, when it, when it deals to cancer, because there's so many components of it. I mean, yes, I can focus on on one area like inflammation or or cancer stem cells or the metabolic pathway or mind, you know, the body mind medicine or you know how to eat or you know what are some of the uh, herbs or supplements or uh, you know I could focus on any one of those areas and and write a a, a book. But I wanted it to be a like a manual for people. You know, here I'm diagnosed, and I need you know I I, I need to have the information in one place, and and that was my goal, so that people can have practical, actionable steps, knowing what kind of labs to take, you know, understanding what cancer is, uh, having tools to be able to, to address the abnormalities in the labs, uh, and then also assess and see. You know, because cancer always, there's a reason cancer appears. It doesn't just, you know, land on you from out of nowhere. It is a process over time that develops over years. And so to be able then to analyze and see why is this taking place in, in me right now and to be able to look and see, you know, how can I, how can I analyze that and how can I address it? And so uh, I felt that those answers or those questions need to be answered. And, and that's why I wrote my book. And what is your top three recommendations to actually reduce cancer? What, what do you typically recommend? What would you say if someone has cancer, what would be your top three recommendations that they should do to kind of reduce that cancer? Well, so so your, your mind is always the, the most powerful tool. You know, so I have people that can do everything wrong and, but yet, you know, their, their mind is at the right place and they have a good effect. And then I have people that do everything right. You know, they, they are meticulous about how they do everything, but their mind is not right where it needs to be. And then the outcome is not as good. So I, I would say, you know, focusing on mind body medicine, you know, like meditation, 
yoga, uh, any anything, or you know, doing being out in nature, you know, enjoying sunshine, uh, being in water, you know, just experiencing nature and, and kind of being in that uh, kind of toning the vagus nerves, so to say, being in that parasympathetic state where you can enjoy life and be happy, feel purposeful, and have intention. Yeah, you know, I would say that that is that is number one. Yeah. You know, all these kind of fancy therapies that we do at my center, yeah, you know, these are add-ons to that. You know, if you you got to have that as the foundation. Uh, number two, I would say sleep. You, you, if if you're not sleeping, you're not detoxifying, you're not healing, you're not regenerating. Uh, your immune system is goes down. Uh, so making sure that you know sleep becomes like the baby that you protect, you know, from all means. So that means you know. And get rid of devices around it, you know, turn off Wi-Fi while you're sleeping, you know, make sure it's dark, you know, make sure it's, it's quiet, uh, and then also turn off. I mean, what we do is we flip off the breaker for the bedroom so that there's no kind of electricity running around you know, the, the walls of the bedroom. Uh, so really kind of protecting your sleep is, is I would say, number two. Um, and then, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's, it's hard between diet and then controlling the toxins around you. <laughs> so I would probably say yeah, as a next step, yeah, I would uh, kind of analyze uh, what is around you and what goes into you. Yeah, those, I, I would analyze that and adjust that and making sure that whatever that is, is not cancer causing, but it is, uh, you know, it's a life affirming. Wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, Dr. Michael, uh, please tell the audience um, how to get in touch with you, um, how to visit more information about your your treatment center and everything else like that. Yeah, uh, so the best way, we have a huge amount of information on, on our website, the carlfoldcenter.com. Uh, through there, you can access a lot of the, the interviews that I've done through my podcast, the cancer podcast that I do. Uh, also, a lot of the old radio shows that, that I've done. Yeah, uh, and and Sylvie, you know, was uh, one of the guests on one of those radio shows. So you can type in Sylvie on my uh, website, and and that interview will pop up. It was an amazing interview, uh, and then uh, uh, so and there are many many hundreds of interviews like that on my website, uh, and then obviously uh, Amazon. Go go to Amazon, buy my book. I think that. Is a, a thirty thirty dollars <laughs> well worth it? Uh, the amount of information that's there, I feel, really kind of grounds an individual and in what they need to know and what kind of action steps to take. Um, and uh, for people, actually, I'm going to extend for people that are concerned about cancer uh, or on their cancer journey, uh, we do offer a, a fifteen minute free discovery call. So you can, you can give us a call at the center at 208-338-8902 and, and just schedule a 15-minute free discovery call. And then we can see where you're at and, and uh, if you know, we, we are a good fit and uh, you know, what, if we can be there and help an individual through their journey. And, and so, uh, so that, that's an open invitation. That's a very valuable one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Uh, Dr. Michael, thank you so much for joining. And thank you everyone for listening. This is the Beljansky Cancer Talk Show. And we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks, guys.